Hi, Jerry. How are you doing? Mariana, I'm doing amazing now that I'm here talking to you. <laughs> Same here. Like my day just went to the moon now. So it's a very, it's a big pleasure to be here speaking with you. It's actually the first time we we are actually speaking one on one, which is crazy because yeah, long like, overdue. Yeah, because I've been following one something for ages. I'm collaborating with you guys. I see how many people you help and your path. You know, like you have an amazing journey in your career. Like where I think I, I'm inspired the most and I think you inspire other people is how authentic and how vulnerable you are in sharing your journey, like your mental health struggles and when you were at Google and everything. So tell me, how was it? How was your journey? Uh, everything, tell me, your job search. Yeah. Um, well, first, um, before we get started, thank you for having me on here and sharing such kind words. I am so honored and um, so humbled to be here speaking with you and everyone who's listening. So first, thank you for having me. The uh, So a little bit about my story. So I uh, grew up, I was born in Korea, but I grew up most of my life in Southern California. And we, I come from an immigrant family where, um, you know, when we, when I was growing up, finances weren't um, something that we had an abundance of. We, I come from a first generation low income household. So it was um, pretty tough growing up because not only did we not have the finances, my parents were trying to figure out how they fit in the U.S. Mm -hmm. culturally, socially mentally it was very when i think back on it i think wow like my parents are crazy for thinking for thinking that they can live a life here um and so but what that ended up doing for me was that i saw how hard my parents worked and it always made me feel man as soon as i get the chance i'm gonna do what's right to my parents and make sure that they feel like their investment in us was worth it and that was always the biggest thing I kept thinking about being like, I can't wait till I'm older. I can't wait till I'm older. And now that I'm older, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to give back to my parents in a lot of ways. And that's what really motivates me for everything that I do with my career, with consulting and everything else in between. That's my biggest motivating factor. Oh, that, that's amazing. So you, you grew up in this place where you actually saw your parents as your like your role models in a way and your goal in life was to give them what they gave you so like your gratitude kind of giving back yeah that's super I, cool i would say that's super spot on and i think my story resonates a ton with a lot of immigrant families out there because mm -hmm. i think a lot of immigrant families share a very similar story where they don't really have much coming here they had to figure it out in some way, somehow. They look back 15 years ago and go, dang, that was a crazy ride. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I cannot really relate with the immigrant part, but I really empathize with like wanting to give back to the place and the yeah. people that gave you. Yeah. And so when you thought about, oh, I want to give back to my parents, I want to give them what they gave me. Did you think like, oh, I'm going to get to Google or... Or in like the business world, how did you manage it? Did you always wanted to go to business? Did you like imposter syndrome, these kind of things, you know? How, yeah. How was it? Uh, funny enough, I never intended to work at Google. Like I, for me, it was always going to be two years of consulting, then two years of business school, and then I'm going to be good enough for me to go into a company like Google. And then so when I was applying to the internship, I remember very clearly, I was like, yeah, like probably not going to work out, but whatever. I'm just going to throw in my application. And I remember I saw it on Handshake, our job applying plat platform. And mm -hmm. I was like, whatever, like, should be fine. Um, and I didn't spend any time networking, nothing. But somehow, some way, they just messaged me um, and was like, hey, Jerry, like, loved your, loved your resume and application. would love to chat with you. And I was like, no way I'm going to get it. And so I, I didn't take the interviews as seriously as I wanted to, um, just because I was like, no, like, no way they're going to accept someone like me. Um, but thankfully, somehow, some way, they did. And that's sort of the journey I had there. Um, sort of through, and that ethos is literally, literally so common throughout my entire career because it very much is like, I think this is a good idea. I have no idea, but I'm going to just try. And somehow, some way, it sort of worked its way out. 
Okay, so you felt the imposter syndrome, you applied sort of just might as well apply and see what happens. That's not self project in a way. And then you were in. And then when you were in, did you still feel like this imposter syndrome? Or are you like, okay, now I'm good enough to be here? Because I've seen that you were like, you were the youngest person there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, funny enough, like, I think um, people often think that like imposter syndrome goes away or like, mm -hmm. um, like after a certain while, it just won't happen to you. Right. And uh, what's really interesting is that I actually had a conversation with my mentor the other week and he was telling and he's a uh, super senior strategy leader at Google and um, and aside, he's an executive coach. And so I asked him, like, like, what do executives even think about? Like they are making millions, like. Like they're so senior, like they're CEOs in Fortune 500 companies, like. Like what could possibly be going wrong or like wrong with their lives, right? And he told me that like they even them, despite of what people may think, they still go through imposter syndrome. They keep thinking, yeah. "Am I good enough? Is this something that I can continue doing?" Right? And that really resonated with me because even today I still feel that way. Um, mm, interesting. With running one consulting, like yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I I'm trying my best. I'm figuring out what I hopefully I'm making the right decisions. But truth be told, like we're all figuring it out. And um, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I've really learned about imposter syndrome is like, it really never goes away. But what really helps is having champions around you to really make sure that like, they're really there to push you and support you, especially during those down times. And for me, Jonathan has been one of those instrumental people for me. Okay, so you find your support system, and then you kind of build from there when you go a bit down. Exactly. Very interesting. Exactly right. Okay. So how would you say it's because from the, the story that you were telling me, you're like, you always felt it, but you kind of just jumped over it, feeling it, you know? Yeah. I've, I've always felt it. Um, but mm -hmm. it was one of those things where like, um, I always just had good people around me to make sure I, I was okay. Um, so Okay. Thankful in a lot of ways, I do feel very lucky because like I had great managers when during my time at Google. Uh, I never felt like anyone was sort of out there to get me or anything. Everyone wanted what was best for me, truly, which is something I'm always super thankful for. Mm -hmm. um, and so despite that, me having imposter syndrome, because I had the right support system in place, it sort of worked yeah. in my favor. Okay, so how would you say, imagine someone doesn't have that support system? Or they have, but they they're still like having. They have to go through this journey where you have imposter syndrome, but you need to be more confident because I think you are. It's easier to deal with it if you are a more confident person. So how how would you advise someone to to like deal with it and become more confident and just go like, okay, this is inside, but like then there's what people see outside. So how do you face it? Yeah, man, I wish I had the. I wish I had a great answer for this. Uh, I really do, but. Um, you know, I think it's so different for everybody, but yeah. if there's someone who's in, facing imposter syndrome today, the biggest thing I recommend that yeah. you sort of think about is um, who are sort of your champions in your life. And if you don't have any, that's completely fine. Because the biggest thing I'd recommend for someone is to make sure you actually go out there and find someone who is going to be your champion, who is going to be your support system. Because truth be told, no one can do anything on their own, at least for a very extended amount of time. Mm -hmm. So that's honestly the first thing. The way I'd recommend you go about it is at work. If you're at work and you're looking for champions and you're feeling imposter mm -hmm. syndrome, um, reach out to the people that you look up to and you go, dang, that person is an absolute star. I want I want to be like them from a professional setting. Reach out mm -hmm. to them and ask them for mentorship. Ask them for help. If it's personal uh, imposter syndrome, do the exact same thing. Find out people who online or maybe in your personal life that you really respect and you're like, dang, like I want to, I, that characteristic about you, I really want. And just reach out to them and just ask them. Cause nine out of 10 times, mm -hmm. I almost guarantee you that people are going to say yes. And the reason why people say yes is because the number one thing that people love to talk about is themselves. <laughs> I love that. that. That's, that's incredibly true. And yeah. I see that as well. I went like to the same journey. I would send so many messages. And I was yeah. like, why this, this person's working at Google, they will never want to speak with me. And then yeah. they would answer and they would tell me like, 
oh, thank you so much for reaching out. Not a lot of people do. And then yeah. I would relate to my struggles. Like I was in the exact same position. It's not because yeah. I'm now in this position, then it's gone. So that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So tell me something like when you look back at your path, because I think you speak a lot about your journey and about, okay, I jumped from here to here and imposter syndrome, but what it's like some things, some like two or three mistakes that you, you've made, they're like, damn, I should not have done that. If there's someone in the same position, you should really not do this. I think the, the biggest thing is, especially coming from an immigrant background, um, my family has always been the type to um, mm -hmm. just brute force their way in. So like, if they don't know, they're going to keep trying over and over and over again until it works. So mm -hmm. that's always an ethos that I was sort of always around. Um, and so as I sort of think back to my career, I very much adopted that same philosophy. Like very much, I always thought to myself, well, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be that person who doesn't need anyone because mm -hmm. that's how I learn best. And I think that has a lot of advantages for sure. But one of the biggest things is that it has so much disadvantage and has a, and it has really big ego sort of start centered in, in all that to be like, I don't need anyone because I'm good enough. Um, again, it's, it's good to a certain extent, but I don't think it's a, it's a healthy way of going about it. I think what is healthier is reaching out to someone and saying, Hey, listen, like Mariana, you have experience doing X would love to just get your opinions on how I should be going about it. Putting that ego aside, asking and reaching out to people to help, um, is probably one of the biggest mistakes I made, um, earlier in my career. And that probably would have allowed me to accelerate even faster in my career. Okay. So reach out to more people, get mentors early on and try to get advice from people who are already doing what you want to do. That's exactly cool. right. Yeah. So yeah, like it sounds about right. And I think you guys are like in a way, because I always think as well about these like kind of offline mentors and reaching out. And I agree like a hundred percent, but it's also about your online feeds. For example, on LinkedIn, following someone like you, someone like Justin, like uh, jo Jonathan, like Austin, like all these kind of people that create content, you're like kind of offline mentors for so many on online, online mentors for like so many people. So I'd say both as well. And, yeah. yeah. And th that's so spot on. And I think at the end of the day, like you don't need to talk to someone directly for you to get motivation mm -hmm. or for you to feel inspired or for you to just be around good energy. Right. Like I, I, I'm a big believer in that. Like the more you surround yourself, do you be sort of become the average of the top five people you spend a lot of time with. And I feel yeah. like that same principle applies to a lot of the things that you read online or how you spend your time online. Right. If you spend a lot of your time mm -hmm. reading like really negative stuff or like people who aren't as motivating, then that energy sort of translates to you and sort of changes the way that you go about your with your mind. So, which is why when Jonathan and I post on Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, everything that we try to do is very much things like, what what do I wish I internalized and knew um, when mm -hmm. I was in college, when I was a year out of school, right? Because a lot of yeah. those things are are things that you have to learn by experience. But the more that someone can just share with you, um, the sort of like yeah. rookie mistakes that they've made, that's really the that's really the goal. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. And I think you guys do that a lot. And I think you also focus a lot, a lot on the mental health fight, which is something I also try to do with like my smaller community, because I think even when you're approaching like job search and all this crazy and known world of careers and jobs, if you don't have the right foundations and the right mindset and you take care of yourself, then you cannot move forward. Do you think like how, because like, yeah, we all heard this sentence and this, this thing where job search is an emotional process more than like all the practical things, building the right resume, building the right, like LinkedIn profile, all these things are clearly very, very important. But in the end, it's like you're getting rejections, ask for rejections after rejection, and you need to have the right mindset. So how do you keep yourself from going when you apply to hundred jobs and you got 99 rejections? How do you do it? What's like the mindset to keep on going? Yeah, um, man, it's so it's 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 a tough one because um, yeah. as much as we talk about the job search is emotional, don't take it personally. Rejection is redirection. Um, mm -hmm. It's still really hard because you might have put in so much time and effort into a role, and for you to go, damn, 
they just didn't see eye to eye with me. That's that's a mm -hmm. tough feeling. Um, so I want I first want to acknowledge that that it is very much of an emotional thing. And if you feel bad after a rejection, it's not because you're weird. It's because it very much is a natural thing. Um, yeah. So that's definitely step one. Um, step two, I think, is like understanding and simplifying the job search. I think is probably the most important thing I've learned. Like, um, for example, like one of the things I've learned is that um, when people don't get any interviews, um, they go, "Man, it must be my resume." But that's mm -hmm. not always the case. It could also be that you're applying to the wrong jobs. It could be that you're applying to the jobs that have been posted for three months and they they already have. Mm -hmm six candidates that they're interviewing. So it could have been a wrong timing thing. So the more that you can sort of simplify, be consistent and ask for feedback along the way, that really is a three-step process for you to just be successful in the job search. At the end of the day, I truly believe that the job search is a matter, is a function of two variables, two variables. <laughs> um, one is the amount of time that you put in. And the second is the amount mm -hmm. of effort, effort being feedback, yeah. being proactive, networking, things like that. Okay, so let's say I'm now on my last year of college and I want, I have no idea. I haven't started applying. I don't know anything about the job, the job market. I don't know anything about resumes. How would you like divide the stages and what should I do in each stage and how, what do I do, would I do to like stand out in the trades? Yeah, um, if you're just graduating college first, um, if this mm -hmm. resonates with you, congratulations. Uh, college, <laughs> graduating college is a huge thing and you should absolutely celebrate. Um, the second thing is that really the first step that I see almost everyone mm -hmm. make mistakes on, especially more junior in their career, is that they're like, you know, I could be good at marketing. I could be good at sales. I could be good at PR. I could be good at software engineering and product. I'm going to just go apply to all five of those roles, which historically may have worked um but mm -hmm. generally what i found is that it actually is beneficial for you to just focus on one keep at it and if it no longer becomes interesting to you move on and find something else right like um the the biggest the biggest mistake that i see people make is that they become generalists mm -hmm. they go i'm gonna be okay. marketing sales boom boom boom, boom. <laughs> Right. And so when a hiring manager looks at a resume that goes, this person can be six <laughs> different roles or this person is a yeah. hardcore marketer, which would you choose? Yeah. Chances are it's going to be the hardcore marketer. Right. So really making sure you specialize in something. And even, and again, knowing that you can change it if you find something from an interview, you're like, eh, I don't really like mm -hmm. it anymore. Cool. Move on to the next one and focus on that. Yeah. I, th I think that's, that's a big thing because I think that was also my issue when I graduated. Because I didn't know where I wanted to get. Yeah. You no, know, but so I did that. I was like, my profile was super general, and I was applying to marketing and to sales and to like VC and consulting, like everything. Mm -hmm. And now I have a clear vision. Vision, but I think a good thing to do as well is even if you're applying to all those positions, if you don't know, you don't have an idea, but you have like this general opinion in each role, you can still like personalize and adapt your resume to each position and try to make it more market related and more sales related. So yeah. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, and what's like hidden tips that you would you always tell people to like find jobs? Because I know you talk about, a lot about that as well. Not just the normal applying, just sending a resume, let's see what happens. Yeah. What's like different strategies that can... the um The biggest hidden tip really which mm -hmm. kind of isn't a hidden tip but like um is network right like at the end of the day i think people worry too much about um the ats the auto rejection software right or they design mm -hmm. the resume such that they cram as many keywords in there as possible which is which again is best practice right mm -hmm. but people often shift so much of their focus on applying to jobs and resume that they forget that the people who, that the ultimate decision that comes down to hiring you comes down mm -hmm. to you comes down to a hiring manager and a hire or a hiring committee going yep you are good enough for this role like you are absolutely uh someone i want to work with right so um that's really the biggest thing here network because at the end of the day robots don't make decisions as to whether or not they hire you mm -hmm. people are the ones who make the decisions yeah i think that's such a big misconception as well 
because it's, it's like no one knows about the ATS and they just think it's like a robot that rejects like this right or left kind of regime. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of yeah. funny actually. Yeah. And like related to LinkedIn, were you already like creating content before you started applying and do you think like that helps you stand out in any way? It's a really good question. I think generally when I was creating LinkedIn content much earlier on, mm -hmm. um, it very much was just me just sharing my experiences. And um, yeah, I had a couple of couple of posts that get that did really well, but other other times I had posts that didn't do as well. Um, but I didn't do it for the likes or votes or anything. Like very much just did it just because I wanted sort of a written diary of sort of my mm -hmm. professional experiences. Um, now, as I sort of look back on it, um, it's it's absolutely something that has helped me in my career. Uh, oftentimes I would go into an interview and someone goes, Hey, listen, before we start, just want to say, I've heard about one salting, or I've heard about the work that you, I've heard about your work on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and I absolutely am a big fan. Let me know if I can help. Right. And then they dove into the interview. So right off the bat, what that does is generally in an interview, um, and this is just general psychology, like within the first 10 seconds or the first 30 seconds, someone is going to have a, this idea of who you are as a person in the back of their mind, given their biases and previous experiences in life. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have a digital presence, they you start off with a clean slate. And the moment you start speaking, the moment you start showing your face on camera, the moment you start doing anything, they're starting to draw a picture of who you are as a person in order for them to go, can I imagine myself working with this person? And can you do the job? But when you have a digital presence, that blank slate becomes what who you are as a person mm -hmm. online. So it makes the process of you networking and you interviewing significantly easier because if they've seen your content or if they've seen some of the work that you've done, mm -hmm. right off the bat, you, you get a ton of brownie points. I did this when I was talking to the president of a company that I want to work for. He mm -hmm. also made a lot of LinkedIn content. So I reached out to him. Hey, listen, I see that you have an open role on your team. By the way, I miss seeing your content. Would love to see more of it. And he replied something along the lines of like, well, hey, I listen. The, the feeling is mutual. I've seen a lot of your stuff too. Why don't I get you connected to my team? And oh. then so how he briefed all of his team was like, oh, this guy's big on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You should check out some of his content. And so now I've already had this sort of like canvas written about me. That's sort of all about mm -hmm. who I am, what I talk about. And so that's what really made me, I feel like made me stand out is people already knew who I was before me even having to talk. Okay. That, that's quite, that's quite interesting. Not only do they see who you are, but they build your persona in their own mind. Well, that, yeah. So you, yeah. you're, you just, you can keep the whole part of having to explain who you are because then you can just go straight into like, okay, this is why I'm the right fit for this position. Yeah. Sorry. And I think, and I think mm -hmm. even before that, like people generally will have an idea of who you are. Um, yeah. so that it just uh, helps that context in everything, right? Like if they see that you're, um, that you're more of an introvert, the way that, and you talk a lot about that in your content, then they mm -hmm. might approach the interview differently than if you're someone who's very extroverted, right? So like mm -hmm. these small, subtle social cues, I think are extremely important. Um, and not many people think about because you, you, social cues aren't something that I can I can just see and go, aha, like it's that thing right there, right? Like uh -huh. it very much is a very loosey-goosey type of topic, but I think it's extremely important because it, I think interviewing is all about psychology. Oh, yeah. Super, super interesting. Yeah. yeah. And like, for example, I know when you were working at B Corps, you were working at like these corporations you had as well, like one salting on the site. Mm -hmm. So you were doing this kind of live where some people go to the left or to the right and you were able to fit both. How was your transition like between doing that and running one salting and be a full-time entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, for me, it never felt like when that, during that transition period, it didn't feel like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason why I didn't feel crazy is because I feel like I had a pretty good, um, I had a pretty good workflow of what my work looked like at one salting. So there was mm -hmm. really no transition transitioning just because I'd already been doing that work for so long. Now, the only thing I remember very clearly is the day I quit, um, or sorry, the day after I quit, I remember mm -hmm. waking up at like 930 and being like, wow, I feel 
great that I don't have to like wake up at 7 a.m. anymore. You know, like <laughs> it's just it's that idea of freedom to me was just like the biggest thing that I am just so thankful for. Okay, so you, you would say, would you say it's like important for you to design your own schedule and everything? Because I also know you talk a lot about how many hours do you sleep, guys? Let's not burn out. So yeah, um, I talk about that a lot because like even for me, it's very hard for me to take my own advice. Um, but yeah. I talk about that a lot because um, I want people to realize that like, hey, there's all these Instagram entrepreneurs and YouTube entrepreneurs who go, Hey, I, you know, I work 16 hour a day, seven days a week, guys. Like that's the only way to be successful. Grind, 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 grind. And like inadvertently what that does to you is you might do that for three months and now suddenly you feel burnt out and go, dang, something's mm -hmm. wrong with me. Right. Yeah. Or similarly, you, you might not adopt that similar type of mentality and go, well, that just means I'm not successful. Like, I just think that focusing too much on input AKA working the number of hours and all that stuff is just a very unhealthy way of thinking about mental health, um, mm -hmm. which is why I, I talk so much about it. I always do these polls on my Instagram or my LinkedIn because I genuinely want to know like how people feel. And every time I post yeah. something about like, Hey, IG entrepreneurs are saying that they work, they sleep three hours, three hours a day. I just slept 11. How many hours did you sleep? I just hope that I can set an example of people to say, Hey, listen, like this guy is, is not working. 15 hour a day, 16 hour a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. He lives a normal life and his career has been successful. Um, yeah. So therefore I know that it's not a matter of me working 16 hour days that is an indica indication of success, but rather it's how you spend the time that you do work. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. And I think everyone that reads that and interacts like really appreciates because I think we need more people like that. So yeah. I have just two last questions for you. And when is how do you deal with your work-life balance and keeping your mental health in check? Yeah. Um, it's funny enough because I do feel like the past two weeks I have struggled with my work-life balance and mental health and all that. Um, uh -huh. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned just sort of working with therapists and um, going through really big ups and downs in my career has been really two things. One has been that it's always going to exist some level of anxiety, some level of you're going to have ebbs and flows of your career, and that's going to be expected. But the second and most important thing that I've learned is you need to have mechanisms in place for you to allow to for you to release that stress, whether it's you spending time to um, hang out with friends, whether it's you taking a vacation, whether it's you taking a walk every morning, whether it's you meditating for 30 minutes a day, whatever that is, you just need to make sure you make time for that. For me, the biggest thing I've learned and when I felt the most stress in my life and most anxiety is when I haven't been able to spend time with good quality times with friends that who I want to see. That's when I feel like I haven't been, like the stress levels are consistent, but because I haven't been able to balance that out with things that I like to do, that's when I'm like, yeah, like I don't feel good. Okay, so for you, it's spending time with your loved ones. Yeah, Yeah. friends, family, everyone. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because I think I'm going through a similar journey uh, because I always have like meditation and sports and there's so many things that like my mental health going up, 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 but I can have everything and I'm quite like ambivert. So I'm extroverted, introverted. I have yeah. both sides. Yeah. But like if I don't have, I don't spend time with people that I do spend, but it's like, I'm not present. It's like everything is going down. For so, sure. So I feel I you. Wouldn't get that. Yeah. So my last question for you. And yeah. maybe more thought provoking was like, if there's one thing and just one thing you'd like everyone to know has a constant reminder in their heads and live with it every single day, what would it be? Don't self reject. Um, this applies to your career. This applies to the job search. This applies to being an entrepreneur. Don't self reject. Oftentimes we think to ourselves, that person is probably going to say no. Why would that person respond to me? That company, I'm not good enough for that company. These thoughts are very real. And whether they're conscious or subconscious, it prevents us from doing reach outs, hanging out with people we may not be as comfortable with, right? Or at least being in situations where we're not as familiar with them, but these situations allow us to grow. That is the single handling biggest thing. Apply to the biggest companies that you wanna work for. Apply to those roles that you're, you don't think you're good enough yet. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, 
reach out to those partners that you don't who, are, who you think are going to say no reach out to ceos that you really want to connect with and you feel like they might be too busy for you because the worst thing that'll happen is it's going to say no but the best thing that can happen is that you now have a relationship with a ceo you now have a dream job that's the story that's literally been the story of my life yeah exactly and, and i'm following your advice right now because look at us i, I reach right. out yeah but see if jerry says no i'm in the same place if jerry says yes look what's happening we have more <laughs> people that's great that's right <laughs> cool so thank you so much for this conversation um i hope like your week is amazing i hope you have more time with people you love that you continue helping millions one million people you are helping at this moment in your network like it's crazy <laughs> yeah mariana i appreciate you for uh giving me your time for being flexible um honestly you're awesome thank you cool thank you see you all right see you later